So, uh, hello everyone. Um, in a time of COVID-19, Chan and Palmer have asked me to lecture on the effect of radical change of circumstances on contracts. The big question is, can you get out of your contract? Uh, if an airplane flies into a high-rise building and destroys it, can you be sued for failure to provide services to some of the businesses that operated from there? Can you sue them for failing to pay you? If you, no. if you promise to cater for a large wedding and the government prohibits large gatherings, can you still insist on delivering the food and suing for the price? Uh, in contract law, the frustration doctrine excuses parties from further performance of the contract when unforeseen events subsequent to contract formation makes performance illegal, impossible, or radically different from the obligations that the parties undertook at formation. Any obligations accruing before the frustrating event remains binding, but neither party can be sued for failure uh, to perform uh, the outstanding obligations. These uh, obligations are extinguished. So frustration is a defense to an action for breach of contract, and it's a complete defense. Uh, so I think we'll, I'll share a screen now, and uh, you will be able to see here we are. Okay, so here we are. We're trying to navigate the difficult <laughs> terrain. Um, let's. So, uh, in Planet Kids Limited in Auckland Council, it's a 2013 New Zealand Supreme Court decision. The New Zealand Supreme Court approached the formulation of the doctrine. Uh, in National Carriers and Panel Pina, which is a, a UK House of Lords decision, they approved this formulation where Lord Simon said, frustration of contract takes place when an event occurs after contract formation. Um, therefore, it must be a supervening event. It must be without fault of either party and for which the contract makes no sufficient provision. Right? So the contract doesn't tell you what's to happen. And that event so significantly changes the nature and not merely the expense or onerousness of the outstanding contractual rights and or obligations from what the parties could reasonably have contemplated at the time of its execution. In other words, at the time you made the contract, that it would be unjust to hold them to the literal sense of its stipulation in the new circumstances. Um, now, one thing to note right from the beginning is that the frustration doctrine is extremely narrow because of the concern to uphold contractual uh, certainty and the party's risk allocation. It's not enough that the change of circumstances makes performance more uh, difficult, um, more onerous or less advantageous for one of the parties. The contract's will only be set aside, discharged in the most exceptional circumstances. I'm going to give you a little bit of history um, and show you how the doctrine developed. Before 1863, the case of Paradine and Jane was authority for the rule of absolute contractual liability, what I would call the no excuses rule, the, the come hell or high water rule. In this case, Jane sought relief from paying rent when um, enemy invasion drove him out of his premises. And the court said, nope. Uh, they said, quote, if the lessee covenants a repair to repair a house, though it be burnt by lightning or thrown down by enemies, yet he ought to repair it. Now that's rather ridiculous. And this case is overturned by Taylor and Caldwell in 1863. In this case, Caldwell hired a music hall and gardens uh, to tailor for concerts on four nights. And he was sued for breach when the music hall burnt down before the first night. Mr. Justice Blackburn found that Caldwell was not liable because the perishing of the person or thing upon which the performance depended 
excuses the performance. So after that, uh, the doctrine was extended beyond physical impossibility to cases where, although the performance was literally possible, it had become something radically different from that which the parties contemplated when it was concluded. Now, this has been called failure of adventure, impracticability, impossibility of purpose. Let me just give you one example. In Jackson and the Union Marine Insurance Company Limited, this is a case from 1874, uh, Jackson's ship was chartered to sail from Liverpool to load a cargo of iron rails and continue to San Francisco. The voyage was delayed for six months because the ship was stranded before the loading of the cargo. And the court held that although it was now literally possible to do it after the delay, that a voyage undertaken after the ship was sufficiently repaired would have been a different voyage. It was different, uh, as different as a different adventure. The delay was so substantial that it destroyed the commercial sense of the original transaction. Now, what's the justification for this doctrine? Um, the, uh, let's have a look, see if we can do this. Uh, well, the first justification is implied terms. And this is what, uh, unsurprisingly, in the first case, Taylor and Caldwell uh, put forward as the justification. Um, in the sense that uh, it, it that the that the contract itself has a term not expressed but implied that um, it will come to an end on the occurrence of the event that actually occurred, uh, and similarly in Templin and Je and uh, Templin Steamship and Anglo Mexican Petroleum Products case in 1916, the court said the relevant question is, were the old conditions such that had the parties thought about them, they would have taken their chances of them, or, that, or such that as sensible men, they would have said, if that happens, of course, it is all over between us. So on this view, the contract ends, the contract is discharged, because that's what the parties would have provided in the contract. Um, and therefore, it's, an, it's so-called the internal point of view because it's what, you know, the idea comes from the idea that freedom of contract, the parties are sovereign over their contract, and it's none of the law's business to regulate it from the outside. And so they, there raises a, a kind of legal fiction that uh, you, the, the contract is discharged because you said it should be discharged, um, although you do it subconsciously. Now, of course, there are problems with this particular formulation. Because um, how can an agreement be implied about an unforeseeable event? Uh, Lord Radcliffe, later on, they, they conceded that. Lord Radcliffe said in Davis and Contractors and Farron, there's something of a logical difficulty in seeing how the parties could even impliedly have provided for something which, um, by definition, they neither expected nor did they foresee. Um, they, it shows you that they really understood this because in another case, the court said, it would be like saying, a tiger has escaped from a traveling menagerie. The milk girl fails to deliver the milk. Possibly the milkman may be, ex may be exonerated from any breach of contract, but even so, it would seem hardly reasonable to base that exoneration on the ground that tiger days accepted must be as if written into the milk contract. All right, so we're gonna pretend that all contracts uh, have a clause saying, well, I'll do this unless a meteorite strikes, unless the enemy invades, invades, or unless there's a pandemic in the world. The second problem with the implied terms formulation is that even if the parties had contemplated the supervening event, the frustrating event, they're unlikely to say that the contract should simply uh, cease to bind the parties, you know, that losses should lie where they fall, that the consequences of frustration are as the law now says that they are. They are likely to want to regulate what happens to the benefits and the detriments that have been suffered in performance of the contract up to that point. Thirdly, uh, 
The third problem with the implied terms formulation is that courts can override what the parties have provided. And the obvious case is in the case called Ertel Bieber and Rio Tinto. And this, in this case, a contract was discharged for frustration on the, um, on the outbreak of war because you can't trade with your enemy. Um, and even if, the even if the contract between the parties say something like, well, we'll just delay it until the war is over. Um, the law of frustration will override it and the contract is completely off, no matter what. Uh, the meaning of a contract must be taken to be, of course, not what the parties intended, um, because they have neither thought of it nor any intentions regarding it but that which the parties as fair and reasonable men would presumably have agreed upon. So you can see how the fiction operates there. They start by saying, well, what did the parties agree? And then what would the parties have agreed if they had thought about it as reasonable people? And as Rad Lord Radcliffe famously said in Davis' Contractors and Farum, by this time, it might seem that the parties themselves have become so far disembodied spirits that their actual persons should be allowed to rest in peace. In their place rises the figure of the fair and reasonable man and the spokesman of the fair and reasonable man who represents after all no more than the anthropomorphic conception of justice is and must be the court itself. So in truth, uh, when a contract is discharged um, for frustration, it is by operation of the law from the outside. The outcome is imposed rather than it, it being what the parties intended. The second justification is that, uh, just for frustration, is that it's just, it just provides a just and reasonable solution. So in, uh, in the Super Servant 2 case, um, the, the court said, that the doctrine was evolved to mitigate the rigors of the common law's insistence on literal performance of absolute promises. The object of the doctrine was to give effect to the demands of justice, to achieve a just and reasonable result, and to do what is reasonable and fair as an expedient to escape from the injustice, which would result from enforcement of contract in its literal terms after a significant change in circumstances. Now, this is all well and good, and it's clearly true, but it can't be uh, the only um, uh, result, only justification, because it's inconsistent with the drastic consequences. If your concern is with justice and reasonableness, it doesn't explain why the law automatically discharges, irrespective of what you say. I mean, if you were really into just and reasonable solutions, you would keep the contract going, but you might adjust some of its terms, and yet that's not what the courts do. So we're left with a third uh, justification, and that is that um, that of radical, because the radical change in the obligations means that you did not consent to perform in those circumstances. And this is now the agreed on uh, uh, rationale. Again, back to Lord Radcliffe in Davis Contractors and Farron. He says, frustration occurs whenever the law recognizes that without default of either party, a contractual obligation has become incapable of being performed because the circumstances in which performance is called for would render a thing radically different from that which was undertaken by the contract. It was not this that I promised to do. And then they go into some Latin. Lawyers do that. They go into Latin and it sounds really clever. Non haec in fodero veni, right? But we should stick to English. Um, <coughs> the radical change test, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> I should be careful about uh, coughing while looking Chinese. Mm. So this radical change test assumes that the parties only consent to perform in a limited, although a wide range of circumstances. There's no performance to, perf there's no promise to perform come hell or high water, uh, come what may. 
when events radically change the circumstances, um, then this takes the contract outside the range that you consent it to. The consent runs out. The question is whether the contract made is on its true construction wide enough to apply to the new circumstances. If not, the contract is at an end. The change of circumstances have to be fundamental enough to change the job the contractors had undertaken into a job of a different kind, which the contract did not contemplate and to which it cannot apply. Okay, so in um, British movie towns and London district cinemas, the court said, if consideration of the terms of the contract in the light of the circumstances existing when it was made shows that they never agreed to be bound in a fundamentally different situation, which has now unexpectedly emerged, the contract ceases to bind at that point. Not because the court in its discretion thinks it just and reasonable to qualify the terms of the contract, but because on its true construction, it does not apply to that situation. So the no consent rationale is now very consistent with other judicial formulations, for example, um, in great peace. And they say, you first have to ascertain, not necessarily from the terms of the contract, but if required from, from necessary inference uh, drawn from surrounding circumstances recognized um, by both contracting parties, what is the substance of the contract? And then to ask whether that substantial contract needs for its foundation, the assumption of the existence of a particular state of things. If it does, this will limit the operation of the general words. And in such a case, if the contract becomes impossible of performance by reason of the non-existence of the state of things assumed by both parties as the foundation of the contract, there will be no breach. Okay, so the test for relief, um, you know, what do you have to prove basically to discharge the, the contract, to be successful in a case of frustration? First, you have to, here is a, a three-step test, okay? And fundamentally, we're going to work our way through these. First, you have to say, um, what does the con contract tell you, okay? Was the risk of change of circumstances expressly or impliedly allocated to one of the parties? All right. I mean, for example, you can say, oh, gosh, after I bought these shares, they went down in price. Well, well tough luck that the risk of that is allocated to the purchaser of the shares. So um, you're out. Right. Secondly, I mean, even if the risk was not allocated, whose fault was it? Is the claimant the person who's trying to get out of the contract? Is that person at fault uh, for not being able to perform the contract. And if they're not at fault, then the question is, did the new circumstances render the obligations to perform radically or fundamentally different from that which was originally undertaken? Okay, and then if it is, you go to the consequences and we will just discuss that in due course. But what we're going to do, confusingly perhaps, is to um, start with number three, because I think that's the uh, easiest one for you to get to get to grips with first, because obviously you need all three. You need to say that the contract, um, uh, the, the contract itself doesn't regulate what happened. Um, it wasn't your fault. And the events which occurred is, is sufficiently serious, sufficiently fundamental. So we're going to start with that one. Okay. So the question is, when is uh, the change of circumstances sufficiently fundamental? We will call these frustrating circumstances. Um, basically, a court has to construe the contract in the light of the nature of the contract and of the relevant circumstances to determine the scope of the original rights and obligations, and then compare it with literal enforcement in the new circumstances to see whether it is a radically or fundamentally different from the original rights and obligations. And the problem 
in this area is it is very difficult to be um, hard and fast or even for lawyers to give you a hard and fast answer about whether your change of circumstances are sufficiently serious. Many, circum many change of circumstances, um, uh, it's a question of degree, okay? Whether it is or not is a question of degree. A contract for the carriage of ice would be frustrated by a shorter delay than one for the carriage of iron rails. And remember what I said earlier, frustration is not lightly invoked to relieve parties from the consequences um, of your contract. Hardship, inconvenience, or material loss is insufficient. The question is whether, back to the same old question, the new circumstances make performance fundamentally different in a commercial sense. In the case of the Sea Angel, and this is approved by the New Zealand Supreme Court in Planet Kids, um, they advocated what they call a multifactorial approach, right? So this is the difficulty. You're weighing up everything and the courts may, a reasonable people may weigh this up in a different way, but it would still be, um, and if the courts might take a different approach depending on who's in the court, obviously. So the court says you have to look at the terms of the contract itself, the matrix or context of the contract, the party's knowledge, their expectations, their assumptions and contemplations, in particular as to risk, as at the time of the contract, in the sense of contract formation, objectively determined. The nature of the supervening event and the party's reasonable and objectively ascertainable calculations as to the possibilities of future performance in the new circumstances. Um, okay, so the following um, overlapping categories give you a, sh um, I mean, it's all very well giving you sort of abstract verbal formulae like this. The only way you can get to grips with it is by looking at examples. So we're going to look at um, the, 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 the categories are normally divided into three, legal impossibility, physical impossibility, and impossibility of purpose. So let's take the very first one, easy one, easiest of the lot, legal impossibility. So contractual performance can be made um, legally impossible by a change of the law or a change of circumstances that trigger the operation of pre-existing law. The law might, for example, prohibit the performance undertaken in the contract for an indefinite duration. Here's some examples, trading with the enemy, okay? Um, in a Hong Kong case, the mainland Chinese authorities imposed a ban on shooting a Kung Fu film in mainland China. So if the ban is for an indefinite duration, um, then the contract is off. Um, a contract for the sale of goods to be shipped to a New Zealand port is terminated if the supervening legislation prohibits the importation of goods of that description. This is the case of Denny Mott and Dixon versus James Fraser. Uh, in another New Zealand case, a contract to sell sections in a subdivision were held to be frustrated when changes were made to the district scheme under the Town and Country Planning Act 1977, which meant that the proposed subdivision would never be able to comply. This is the case of Hay and Laurent uh, Construction Limited, 1990, one New Zealand convincing, um, 190,386. In Gore District Council and the Power Company Limited, uh, in, in 2003, the Electricity Industry Reform Act of 1998 prohibited a person from being involved in both an electricity lines business and an electricity supply business. The power company found itself in that situation and um, as a result of a contract entered many years before. But in this case, the legislation didn't frustrate the contract, did not frustrate the contract, because the legislation expressly provided that an agreement lawfully entered into 
um, did not become illegal or unenforceable in the circumstances. It itself provided for how the matter was to be resolved. Secondly, the law might deprive a party of control over the subject you were going to lease someone, but the New Zealand government compulsorily acquires your land um, for use for the COVID uh, emergency. Um, you know, or they can just compulsorily um, requisition your ship or um, your truck, for example. Now, as I've said, the public policy underlying the illegality overrides the party's express provision. Um, even though the parties might say, oh, well, it's okay, we'll resume afterwards, um, you can't. The, 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 the public policy will override the party's agreement. Now, aside from trading with the enemy, a supervening event will only frustrate a contract if it makes a radical difference to the contractual obligations originally undertaken, and not if it merely delays or hinders its operation. And again, it's a matter of degree. Um, in Metropolitan Water Board and Dick Kerr, a contract to build a reservoir uh, in a period of six years, um, but the government ordered the builders to cease work and to remove and sell their plant. This was during the war, during Second World War. The contract itself provided for the delay. And they said, oh, we can, you know, you can, it's six years, but you can extend our time whatsoever and howsoever occasions. So we never let you off because, you know, because we're going to give you extra time. And the court held, I mean, it would be like me saying, you know, um, but I'll take that the land was requisitioned for, you know, 50 years. And then 50 years later, I say, oh, I'll have that land, please, at the rate we agreed. You know, that would be a random bargain. That would obviously be wholly unfair and not the agreement that we made. Um, at least still had 90 years to run. OK, sorry. So it wasn't it, the government restriction came in nine years into the lease and it still had 90 years to go run. So the court said you can't frustrate the contract because um, you know, it's likely to be a small fraction of the whole term. Now we go to physical impossibility. Now the clearest case of frustration is when supervening event makes the performance physically impossible, usually only for one of the parties because the other will still be able to perform their contract i.e. to pay money, right? Um, so impossibility of performance, on the other hand, is not enough and it is not necessarily necessary, i.e. impossibility of performance in and of itself is insufficient and it's unnecessary. First of all, impossibility of performance is insufficient um, because even a wholly unforeseen catastrophe will not excuse a party if the construction, if the risk allocation of the contract shows that she has undertaken to pay damages anyway. There's a difference between misjudgment and wholly unforeseen events. The court said a man may undertake to do that which turns out to be impossible, and yet may, he may still be bound by his agreement. Okay, so I mean, if I undertake to do a fitness video and I agree that in the fitness video I will do 10 chin-ups and um, 100 push-ups uh, and it turns out that it's physically impossible for me to do nevertheless I would be liable for breach of contract because I should never have a promise that I would do it okay um, because you know the contract allocates the risk of not being able to do it to me secondly impossibility of performance is unnecessary because legal impossibility and impossibility of purpose may frustrate the contract even though they are still physically possible to um, perform and there's the issue about uh, the supervening event may not make it totally physically impossible it might only be partially impossible and in the, such a case it is again a question of degree I mean, we saw that with the lease issue, right? If, if, the, um, if the impossibility is only for a short amount of time in proportion to the entire contract, you might find that the court won't allow you to frustrate the whole contract. Let's give you some examples. 
Death or incapacity in personal service contracts will frustrate the contract. Uh, so, for example, the death of someone, you know, I hire uh, Pavarotti to come and sing at my father's birthday party, but he's dead. Okay, well, um, I'm not going to be able to sue him for breach. Uh, that frustrates the contract. If, the, um, if that party is interned, conscripted, imprisoned for all or substantial remainder of the contract's duration. Now, in that case, um, if it's imprisonment, of course, it's kind of the person's own fault for getting themselves into prison. So they can't frustrate the contract, but the other party who's hiring them to do the job can frustrate the contract and therefore not pay. If you're incapacitated by illness, um, an employment contract uh, was frustrated when an employee suffered a heart attack and really would never work again. But illness doesn't necessarily frustrate a contract of employment. We all know that. The question is one of degree, namely whether the employee's incapacity or likely incapacity is such that further performance of his obligation in the future would either be impossible or would be a thing radically different from that undertaken by him and accepted by the employer under the agreed terms of the employment. Relevant considerations include the terms of the contract, the nature and duration of the employment, and the nature of the illness, the period of past service, and the prospect of recovery. And of course, the contract is not necessarily frustrated by death or incapacity if the performance is not of a personal character. For example, a contract between uh, performers and the music hall proprietor would not be frustrated by the death of one of the um, proprietors of the hall. Okay, the second uh, type of um, frustration, uh, um, physical impossibility, is destruction of the subject matter. Now, for example, you, you hire a hall and it's destroyed by fire. Okay, another case is Apple B and Myers where the contract to supply and install machinery in a factory was frustrated when the fire destroyed the factory, including the machinery that you um, uh, installed. Now, the courts have even suggested that leases could be frustrated wholly exceptionally if there is a literal disappearance of the premises, as where some quote, vast convulsion of nature swallowed up the property altogether or buried it in the depths of the sea. For example, a tsunami, you know, or that the property falls into the sea by erosion. Or if an upper floor was totally destroyed by fire or earthquake. There's a famous Hong Kong decision um, in 1980, which was um, on decision of the Privy Council and appeal from Hong Kong. The question involved whether 24 contracts of the sale of flats by China Kim to um, Wong in two towers blocks to be built by China Kim is frustrated by a major landslip, which was unforeseen, unforeseeable, and caused by circumstances beyond the control of the parties. Um, part of the hillside above the site slipped down the hill taking with it a block of flats of 13 stories. The debris from this, um, with many hundreds, hundreds of tons of earth landed on the building site, it obliterated the work that had already been done. It killed 67 people. The authorities deemed the whole area unsafe and barred uh, people from the site while agents um, rescue work was undertaken and they didn't know if they would ever be allowed to return to the site. The court held that the contract was frustrated. Okay, whether the subject, where the subject matter of the, um, of the contract is only partially destroyed, frustration is a matter of degree. In Asfar and Blundell, a cargo of dates was submerged for two days and it was so affected by sewage water as to become for business purposes something completely different. Although it could still be sold for some value, uh, the contract was frustrated. In Jackson and her, um, Union Marine Insurance, we talked about the charter party being frustrated 
uh, when on the first day it was grounded, the ship was grounded and it wasn't refloated or repaired for six months. The damage caused such delay that it would amount to practical commercial destruction. Performance uh, after the delay would be of no use uh, to the charterer. I think we can do a little bit more. Uh, we can talk about the failure or disruption of supplies. Now, contracts for the sale of fungible goods, interchangeable goods like wheat or, you know, most goods are fungible, fungible in the sense that you can just go out into the marketplace and replace it and buy something else the same. They are rarely frustrated because uh, subject to physical or legal impossibility, the source of supply is normally at the supplier's risk. The supplier can always find an alternative source, albeit at a greater cost and inconvenience. So where a particular source was only intended by one of the parties, failure of that source will not frustrate the contract. So if I uh, order, you know, 500 masks for you because of, from you because of the COVID-19 and you, your own source um, that you were trying to get it from uh, dries up and, and they won't deliver to you, that's not my problem. You might have to go to someone else to and spend and then, you know, because of price gouging and so on, you might have to go, go and um, buy masks at a much greater price, but you still have an obligation to deliver to me because it's none of my problem where you get your masks from. On the other hand, a contract can be frustrated if the source of supply was, in was you could show that it was intended by both parties and it fails, sorry, it fails without a fault of either party. For example, if a potato crop grown on land is specified in the contract and it fails through drought or disease, or the importation of goods from a particular place has become impossible due to war, natural disaster, or prohibition of exports. So if um, you, you both uh, intend a specific source of supply and that supply fails, then you have frustration. Now, where the commonly intended source only partially fails, a term will be implied requiring the supplier to deliver the smaller quantity available. The supplier is relieved only to the extent of the deficiency. And that is really for reasons of fairness. In Sainsbury and Street, 1972, one weekly law reports, Street agreed to sell to Sainsbury's a supermarket 275 tons of barley grown on Street's farm. So there's an agreed source. But the yield was only 140 tons, which Street then said, oh, well, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't harvest 275 tons. Sorry about that. Uh, so they then went off and sold it to a third party for an inflated price because potatoes were particularly scarce. And the court held that Sainsbury's should have the option of requiring um, Street to deliver the tonnage which was actually produced. Otherwise, in a time of failing crops, the supplier could disregard its contract and profit from rising prices by selling to someone else. So note that the, the courts are trying to put in a bit more of a flexibility in the response by varying contract rather than uh, automatically discharging it. Um, okay, I'm going to take a break now and we'll come back and we'll look at um, uh, other instances of physical impossibility. Okay, we'll stop. Can I stop? Cool. All right, then. So we're going to continue and uh, we, we are uh, on the topic of physical impossibility and we're going to continue uh, by talking about delay and hardship. Now, we know that few contracts are impossible to perform. It all depends on the state of the technology and the amount of trouble and expense that a party can be expected to go to to uh, rectify any problems that have uh, occurred during to the super, supervening problem, um, supervening event, sorry. But nevertheless, the um, UK word is still impossible to stress how high the threshold is. In the United States, they have a softer word, 
um, to indicate a wider scope of frustrating circumstances than under uh, the English common law on which New Zealand law is based. The Uniform Commercial Code, paragraph or article 2615, prefers the terminology of impracticability. And the second restatement of the law of contract, paragraph 261, refers to extreme and unreasonable difficulty, expense, injury, or loss to one of the parties. Well, you can see that it's, you know, how, 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 how long is a piece of string? I mean, how far is this thing uh, physically impossible? How unreasonable do we think it is to expect someone to um, fix the problems that have occurred? So delay and hardship could have uh, many potential causes. Charter parties, for example, can be affected by the ship being stranded or requisitioned or seized or detained, um, or they may be affected by strike or the closure of intended routes. Building contracts can be affected by the shortage of labor and materials or by wartime restrictions. In Pioneer Shipping Limited and Tioxide, otherwise known as the Lima, the NEMA. Um, the issue is whether the effect of the super, supervening effect event, sorry, whether the effect of the supervening event um, has on the performance of the obligations undertaken fall outside what the parties could reasonably contemplate at the time of contracting. Now, three particular factors are significant to a finding of frustration in these circumstances. First, the increased difficulty of performance must be caused by a new and unforeseeable event and not merely be within the commercial risk undertaken. Um, so example, Davis Contractors and Farum, which we've mentioned before, but we can now dive more deeply into it. In this case, Davis agreed to build 78 houses for Farum. The work took almost three times the amount of time that they intended, and it cost 17,000 pounds more than was planned. Uh, this is, um, with inflation, that would be a lot of money. And this is because of serious labor shortage and difficulties in obtaining supplies, building supplies. The defendant completed the performance but argued that the contract was frustrated so that they were not confined to the contract price. They said, the contract is off. We're not limited to what the contract said that would pay us, but we'd like to claim a quantum merit, a claim for a reasonable price, a uh, reasonable market price, and that would exceed um, the um, amount which the contract stipulated. So they claimed an extra 17,000 pounds. The House of Lords rejected this claim because first of all, they said that by agreeing a fixed price, the defendant took the risk of increased costs and delay. The, secondly, the difficulties were clearly foreseeable and the defendant could have provided for them in the contract. And thirdly, although the defendant's performance was significantly more onerous, it was not radically different from that originally undertaken. So Lord Ratcliffe said, it is not hardship, or inconvenience or material loss itself would cause, which calls the principle of frustration into play. There must be as well such a change in the significance of the obligation that the thing undertaken would, if performed, be a different thing from that contracted for. So frustration will not be available where building contracts encounter delays or disruption in the supply of labor and materials, or where rising prices eat into the builder's expected profits. Um, as Lord Reed said, although the delay was greater in degree than was to be expected, it was, not it was not caused by any new and unforeseeable factor or event. The job proved to be more onerous, but it never became a job of a different kind from that contemplated in the contract. Now, a New Zealand equivalent is Wilkins and Davies Con Construction Limited versus Geraldine Borough in 1958. The contractors agreed to construct certain works in connection with the defendant's sewage treatment plant and, in Geraldine. The works included sinking a tank and a pump chamber below the ground. 
Now they experienced great difficulty because the ground contained very heavy clay and that made it impossible to excavate by machine and it was really difficult to keep um, the floor of the tank dry during the construction. So as a result, their costs rose very substantially. They claimed to frustrate the, claim, uh, frustrate the contract and also to be paid on the basis of quantum merit for the additional work that they had to do. So if the contract is gone, you can then claim a reasonable market price for the work that you've done. And that would, it, where that would exceed the contract price, it's in your favor. This claim was rejected by Mr. Justice Henry, who said that uh, when I apply the test, I must confess that I am unable to see that the plaintiff has made out a case of frustration. The fact that a band of clay was encountered is of little significance. It has no more than an unexpected burden in sinking the tank, resulting from a small portion of the terrain differing from what was anticipated. So it must also have been relevant that builders, in giving quotes, know that they might encounter unexpected hazards and if they don't provide for them in the contract, then it's assumed that they've taken the risk that that is happening. Now, what about some other circumstances? Um, inflation, fluctuations in the value of currencies will not normally frustrate the contract. Although, you know, there's always a little let out. You know, they say fluctuations of a wholly astronomical order might do so. And that, that sort of is a nod to the fact that this whole um, jurisdiction on frustration was sort of popularized during the German hyperinflation um, after the First World War. So if um, the price for buying, um, I don't know, a huge shopping mall, you know, because of hyperinflation, six months later, you can buy a cabbage, then it might be that we should frustrate the contract. Um, in uh, severe economic crisis will not normally frustrate the contract. In uh, Tandron Aviation and Aero Toy Stores in 2010, two Lloyd's report, the court rejected the argument that the unanticipated, unforeseeable and cataclysmic downward spiral of the world's financial markets in 2008 was sufficient to constitute a force majeure event. And they rejected that and they said it would also not amount to frustration. Uh, in the case of um, Tees and Byers, the court said that bad weather conditions which delayed the unloading of a cargo for four, four days did not frustrate the contract. The charterers had been given a number of days for unloading and it must take the risk of any ordinary vicissitudes. All right. I, I mean, the same general uh, principle applies to delays in loading or unloading caused by strikes. And um, here's a New Zealand case in the employment con context. In Car um, Carol, mm, Carol, Carol Flott, AO and Yudavenko, the plaintiff and others were employed as crew on a chartered fishing vessel. When the contract had five weeks left to run, the vessels were forfeited under the Fisheries Act 1983. The ship owners purported to terminate the employment contracts. Um, the Court of Appeal held against the ship owners' plea of frustration. The court said the doctrine will not readily be available to employers because of the drastic effects it might have on vulnerable employees. In this case, three factors pointed against frustration. At the time of formation, the owners must have known that the charter company, the, the borrowers of the ship, were facing prosecution under the Fisheries Act and that there was a risk of forfeiture, so it must be held to have elected to take the risk once you know of the risk. The Act of Parliament providing for forfeiture also provided for negotiation of possible release and the correspondence with the Ministry of Fisheries shows that release would be agreed to in this case. Thirdly, the employment contract only had five weeks out of the nine months to run, so they were not going to allow frustration so that they didn't have to pay the employees. And then we come to the case of Planet Kids and Auckland Council. Um, in, in this case, Planet Kids operated a childcare facility on 
property leased from the Auckland Council. The Council gave notice of an intention to acquire the leasehold interest under the Public Works Act because it wanted the land to build roads. Planet Kids objected and on the 3rd of June 2010, the parties entered into a settlement agreement. Under the settlement agreement, Planet Kids were to receive compensation for the loss of goodwill resulting from the closure of the business. The council also agreed to forego a disputed claim for rent. The council was to receive a surrender of the lease, a restraint of trade covenant from Planet Kids and the plant and chattels on the premises. Settlement was to take place on the 20th of September. In August, Planet Kids advised its staff and the parents that the childcare business would close and the council awarded a tender for uh, road work. So everything was on the way. On the 20th of October, the building on the site was destroyed by fire. The council then took the view that the settlement agreement had been terminated by frustration and that therefore they did not owe the money due under the agreement. They weren't going to pay. They said the contract's been frustrated because of course they knew that um, they weren't going to be rebuilding. The Supreme Court held that the agreement had not been frustrated. Planet Kids was unable to meet its obligation to transfer the plant and chattels to the council and to provide a form of surrender of the lease, but that wasn't enough to render the common purpose of the contract unattainable. So there's the introduction of the idea of the main or the common purpose. The council could still get vacant possession, even without a form of surrender, and it could enforce the restraint of trade agreement. The settlement agreement meant that it had the certainty um, and needed to make arrangements to undertake the roadworks in accordance with its own timetable, and it had that. As the Chief Justice Elias said at the time, all the important benefits sought by the council, closure of the business, discharge of the lease, vacant possession, the ability to meet its own construction timeframe in constructing the road, they, uh, so all the important benefits sought by the council were obtained by it. And moreover, Planet Kids could obtain the benefit it wanted from the agreement, compensation, and the foregoing of the disputed rent. Ms. Um, uh, Justice Glazebrook delivering judgment for herself um, for Macross, Mac Macross and um, they, he, anyway, she put it in the following way. She said, this is not a case where the settlement agreement has become impossible to perform in its entirety. So again, it's a partial failure. Indeed, the only obligation that cannot be performed by Planet Kids either is either of no moment to the council, the transfer of the chattels, or a mere technicality, the transfer of the surrender of the lease document. Further, the main purpose of the settlement agreement, being the settlement of the Public Works Act objection, was achieved immediately on entering into the settlement agreement. Certainty of acquisition, the timing of that acquisition, and the price payable for the lease and the business was also achieved. Certainty was important for both parties. So, despite the fire, performance of the main obligations was still possible, and one couldn't say that the performance of the contract had been rendered radically different. And um, in addition, what was relevant to the case was also the hardship and the unfairness that would be caused to Planet Kids by a finding of frustration. Um, and the lack of hardship on the council um, by finding no frustration, i.e., you know, this was the fair thing to do. That's very New Zealand, right? To look at effectively, despite not having a good faith doctrine, doing what's in good faith. In Power Company and Gore District Council, a contract was entered into in 1927 and it required electricity to be supplied at one penny per unit as opposed to the current price of 10.2 cents per unit. The agreement was expressed to be for all time hereafter. Now the court held that the contract was not frustrated because they've become simply more burdensome or because um, performance was more expensive. In fact, they said the changes over the years um, sometimes were to the, to the board's advantage, the, um, the 
the, the, the supplier of power. The owners were um, they were unmoved by the argument that the modern frenzy to deregulate public utilities was unknown in 1927 when the contract was made and that um, local government reforms had changed all of this. The Court of Appeal said that in a contract between public utilities, the exercise of executive and legislative powers might be a better means of dealing with changes in circumstances than the doctrine of prostration. But a prolonged strike may exceptionally frustrate the Charter Party because of the operation of two factors. Um, first is that the parties are entitled to know where they stand. So if you have a delay of some sort, um, if there's a strike, a party can claim frustration, although the delay through delay before the expiry of the time for performance, since the party should be able to rearrange their affairs in response to the event and not be left in suspense. So in the NEMA, Lord Roskill said, it is often necessary to wait upon events in order to see whether the delay already suffered and the prospect of further delay from that cause will make ultimate performance of the relevant contractual obligations radically different from that which was undertaken. But as has often been said, businessmen must not be required to wait events too long. They're entitled to know where they stand. Whether or not the delay is such as to bring about frustration must be a question to be determined by an informed judgment based upon all the evidence of what has occurred and what is likely thereafter to occur. Often it will be a question of degree, whether the effect of delay suffered and likely to be suffered will be such as to bring about frustration of the particular venture um, in question. So it's the idea that if you can see a train coming for you, you don't have to wait until it actually hits you before you plead frustration. You should be able to jump off the train, make other arrangements and run away, okay? So um, even if the, fr yeah, you, if, there, if you can see a delay or some supervening event and it occurs before the performance of your own contract, you can try to frustrate the contract straight away. But again, they always say it's a matter of judgment and it's our judgment that counts. Some other examples, the NEMA, uh, in this case, a ship was chartered for seven consecutive journeys between April and December. Um, after the first voyage, strikes began um, in June and it grounded the ship. On the 3rd of October, uh, an arbitrator, and later this was upheld by the House of Lords, decided that the contract was frustrated. Um, so April to December, the contract strikes begin um, on the 6th of June. And on the 3rd of October, they said, we've had enough. We're going to frustrate the contract. And the court said, yep, that's fine. You can frustrate the contract, even though, and no one foresaw it, the strike ended two days later. Uh, in another case, in Veracruz and Reed, a charter party for a voyage through the Dardanelles was frustrated on the outbreak of war between Greece and Turkey because it was thought that the Dardanelles would be closed for the entire length of the charter party. Now, in fact, it was actually opened for a period during the contract, um, during which the contract could have been performed. But you can only um, uh, decide on the basis of the facts that were foreseeable at the time you claim frustration. And I guess it's the same with COVID. I mean, you know, we know we're in a four week lockdown, but we also can possibly foresee that it might be extended. And so at what point do you uh, frustrate a contract for delay, even though it is before the time of performance? You can see that with people planning weddings, for example, planning big events. Okay, so <clears throat> another factor which is significant to finding frustration is that, of course, performance in the new circumstances must be radically um, uh, different from the, uh, the original rights and obligations. Now, in this, we can identify three categories. First, where, a clear, uh, where it's clear from the terms or nature of the contract that it's to be performed 
only at a specified time or within a specified period. A subsequent delayed performance may be of no use to the recipient and so frustrate the contract. So, I mean, we can see that if I'm supposed to uh, cater uh, for the Olympic Games, but um, it's been called off, um, you know, uh, 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 it's very hard to say, well, we'll do it later. Now, I know that in this case, well, we'll need to see what the contract actually says, but let me give you an example. And that's a case that we've looked at. And that's Jackson and Union Marine Insurance uh, with, with respect to the six months delay. And the court said that, that the voyage after the delay would be a different voyage from the one undertaken, as it would be an autumn rather than a spring voyage, which was crucial in the context of the contract. Okay. Um, uh, another example, you know, I, I want, I want um, Pavarotti to, to, to perform at my father's birthday party. Um, he is not well and he says, I'll do it later. Now, I might say, well, there's no point doing it later because then it won't be his birthday and I don't need anybody then, you know. Um, so that, that's the difficulty. Okay. Now, um, where are we up to? Whoops. Okay, the second type of category is where performance after the delay would occur in a radically altered market. Uh, the contract will be frustrated. So in Acetylene Corporation of Great Britain and Canada Carbide, a shipment of goods sold was delayed for three years by wartime requisitioning. And the contract was held to be frustrated because the market conditions would radically change in that time. Uh, similarly, in Metropolitan Water Board and Dick Kerr, wartime restrictions delayed indefinitely the performance of a contract uh, to build a reservoir for two years, um, six, in, two years into a six-year contract. And um, the House of Lords found that frustrate, frustration because they said the project is so disrupted that enforcement of performance would not be to maintain the original contract, but to substitute a whole new contract. Lord Pamor said, I agree that the probability of hardship to one side or the other is not a matter of material consideration, but it is quite a different matter when there is an indefinite and indeterminate liability which might impose on either party an unforeseen burden totally foreign to the ordinary incidents in a contract of this character. Performance at some future period will be under different contract, under a different contract based on changed considerations. All the prices will have to be fixed um, in reference to different conditions and the time over which the work will be carried on will be wholly different. The third factor is that where the contemplated means of performance is made impossible by a supervening event, a contract might be frustrated. Uh, where um, this means is the only method of complying with the contract, or if the alternative means radically alters the obligations undertaken. So if the method by which you were going to perform the contract becomes impossible, then um, if it's the only method or if any other method would be um, totally different, then you can frustrate the contract. So in Codelpha, construction, uh, an Australian case, a contract to excavate a tunnel within 130 weeks. This was frustrated when the means contemplated by both parties to enable a timely completion was um, interrupted by an injunction which prevented work from 10 to 6, 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. They were want going to work around the clock in order to do it, but that was prohibited by law. S um, Secondly, in, but, uh, you, but, you know, uh, in the Eugenia, this is another case, a charter party um, to sail between Genoa and India. Normally, this, you would go through the Suez Canal. 
And this was affected by the blocking of the canal during the Anglo-French invasion of Egypt in 1956. The alternative route was via all the way around the bottom of Africa, around the Cape of Good Hope. And this, this increased the journey time um, from 108 days to 138 days. The court held that the contract was not frustrated. They said the difference was not sufficiently radical because the cargo was not such as to be affected by the delay, right? If it was, I don't know, cargo of mangoes, it might have gone off, um, but it, it, in this case, it wasn't. There was no evidence that the early arrival of the cargo in India was of particular importance. So clearly they're looking at the effect, you know, whatever they say, they're looking at the effect of this, um, of this frustrating circumstance. Now, a contract is not frustrated, therefore, if the alternative means of performance does not fundamentally differ from the intended means, even if the intended means was stipulated in the contract. So in um, this difficult to pronounce case called um, Sakiroglu Sak Sak and nobly Thor, <laughs> An alternative performance was via the Cape of Good Hope, again, rather than the Suez Canal. And it was, in fact, three times longer than the intended route, and it was far costlier. But the House of Lords said the contract was not frustrated. They said the contract was not commercially or fundamentally different because the route of delivery is normally irrelevant to the buyer. The goods were not perishable. There was no date fixed for delivery and there was no shortage of available shipping carrying goods via the Cape. So um, if it was different, if these factors were different, then obviously frustration is much more on the cards. We then come to the third um, head of frustration, third type called impossibility of purpose. This is a very controversial one um, because the contract is frustrated, although Performance is not illegal, and it's not impossible, or uh, it may not even be more onerous, right? The recipient of the performance may claim that the supervening event has so undermined the purpose of the contract for her that she should not be required to accept the performance or to pay for it. Now, the obvious danger with this category is its potential width and the danger of allowing complainants to escape from a bad bargain. And its existence has attracted criticisms, but the Supreme Court in New Zealand acknowledged that it makes sense with regard to most contracts to say that the parties have a common object and that this common object will be well understood by them. And if it has become unattainable, then the contract will be frustrated. So two factors. Uh, severely restrict the scope of this and limit it. Uh, the first, the purpose which has become impossible to achieve must be common to both parties and have expressly or impliedly been assumed by the parties as the foundation or basis of their contract. If the frustrated purpose is only of one of the parties, um, then there will be no frustration. Um, and generally, it will be difficult for a, a party to establish that her purpose, even if obvious, was shared by the other party. We'll come give an example. Um, and secondly, the common purpose must be thwarted to a very high degree. Now, um, the first uh, type of cases that we are going to discuss under the heading of impossibility of purpose is the non-occurrence of an event. So very exceptionally, the non-occurrence of an event that constitutes the basis of a contract can frustrate the contract. The key case here is Crowell and Henry. This involved uh, the, the cancellation of the coronation of, um, of the king in the UK. Uh, the, the, this, the contract was to hire a room above Pall Mall in order to see the procession passing under uh, Pall Mall. The contract was frustrated when the coronation was canceled because the contract was 
for the hire of a room for the purpose of seeing the royal procession. It wasn't just a, an agreement to, to let rooms. And this could be inferred. So the common purpose could be inferred from the position of the flat, the owner's own advertisement for the window to view the royal coronation, right? So um, you can't just say, oh, well, I hired you a room. I don't care what you use it for. They hired out a room specifically to watch the coronation. And thirdly, the unusual higher terms. There was an enhanced price um, charged for two days and it was excluding the, in the nights. So clearly, the more detailed description of the common contractual purpose, the more likely it is that the supervening event will frustrate it. Um, Crowell and Henry said that there will be no frustration, for example, if a contractor hire a taxi to go to um, Ipsum Derby Day, you know, to go to the races, um, you know, was made pointless when the races are cancelled. The purpose is only that of the customer. The cab has no special qualifications for the purpose. Um, they don't really care. Any other cab would have done, right? So similarly, if I had hired a room to watch the Tokyo Olympics, um, that for, for, the, for 2020, and that was cancelled, they could say, well, you can still come to Tokyo and, and, and occupy the rooms, right? If they, you know, obviously we can't at the moment because of the lockdown. But let's say that the lockdown was lifted by the dates that I'd hired the rooms. I could still argue that um, there's a frustration of purpose, particularly if the rooms had been advertised on the basis that it would allow you to be close to the vicinity and go and uh, watch the live action. Now, what happens with partial frustration? In Hearn Bay, Steamboat and Hutton, the, um, Hearn Bay hired out pleasure boats for the purposes of viewing the naval review and for a day's cruise around the fleet. The naval review was cancelled along with the coronation. So the cancelled coronation generated lots of cases. I imagine the cancellation of the Tokyo Olympics are going to generate a lot of um, cases. The Court of Appeal, in this case, rejected the claim of frustration. They regarded um, Hearn Bay's venture uh, to charge passengers for the cruise as at his own risk, all right? By analogy to the cab hire, they said that although the object of the hire might be stated, that statement would not make the object any less a matter for the hirer alone and would not directly affect the person who was letting out the vehicle for hire. Moreover, um, Herm Bay's purpose was not entirely thwarted. He could still cruise around the fleet. The fleet was still there. So first of all, it wasn't the common purpose. Second of all, it wasn't thwarted to a high enough degree. What about leases and sales of land? Now, this will be, I guess, quite relevant um, in the light of COVID. Now, it was once thought that leases could not be frustrated because a lease is more than a contract uh, and it vests an proprietary right, a, an estate in the land, a property right that remains even if a supervening event negates the purpose of the lease. But in the House of Lords, in uh, the case called National Carriers and Panopina, they, expected, they accepted that leases can, in principle, be frustrated, right? Although hardly ever, they said, all right? So in, in National Carriers and Panopina, this involved a 10-year lease of a warehouse which was uh, agreed to be used only as a warehouse for the lessee's business. Five years into the lease, the local authority closed the street and provided the only, um, the, sorry, they closed the street that provided the only vehicular access to the warehouse for 20 months. The court said the contract was not frustrated. They said in principle it could have been, but it wasn't because the length of the unexpired term of the lease, more than three years, was a potent factor in the court's decision. And it suggests. Um, that a lease would have, would have been frustrated had the prohibition been for much longer or had it been permanent, right? 
So it's about proportionality as well of the amount of the lease that couldn't be used for the purpose for which you intended. So I've uh, talked about Cricklewood and Leighton's, a 99 year old, uh, sorry, a 99 year building lease would not be frustrated by wartime building restrictions imposed when it still had 90 years to run and the war was likely to last for only a fraction of that term. Okay, now here's a, a case which is pretty on point, uh, but it, it comes from Hong Kong. Uh, Li, Li Ching Wing and Xuan Yi Xiong. Okay, 2004 one Hong Kong court, if you want to look it up. This involved the outbreak of SARS, the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome in Hong Kong. Uh, in 2003. The defendant leased an apartment for two years. Now the apartment that uh, was in a block and it was infected with the disease. So the defendant moved out. The Department of Health issued an order to isolate the block for 10 days. The residents were evacuated and the defendant then sought to end the lease um, and they said it was frustrated. The plaintiff, the landlord sued for damages. The court found no frustration. They said that this um, being evacuated out for 10 days uh, didn't significantly change the nature of the contractual rights and obligations from what the parties could reasonably have contemplated at the time of entering it. Likewise, in another Hong Kong case, um, Yung Ki and uh, Chung So Yin Ki, 1983, um, one HKC. This was a lease of four years less than three months before the expiry, uh, fire destroyed the whole building. The tenant claimed frustration and they returned, they claimed the return of the deposit. The court said no. The closer one gets to the end of the contract, the more difficult it is to say, this is not what I contracted for. A point may be reached where one has already substantially got one, got what one bargained for. The issue is whether we should relieve the tenant of the rent which is otherwise due. So a frustration of a lease is much more likely if commercial premises are let for a short term, if it's let for one principal purpose known to the lessor, if that purpose gives the premises its substantial value, and if the supervening event defeats that purpose for a substantial portion of the lease. Okay. All right, so um, in New Zealand, Maori Trust and Prentice, a 1992 case, accepted that frustration can apply to leases, but not on the facts of that particular case. Another case uh, where they actually applied it and they said there was no frustration was Roman Catholic Bishop of Christchurch and RFD Investment 2015, New Zealand High Court case. In this case, this involved a perpetual lease, so you're, you're in trouble then already. A perpetual lease was not frustrated by a notice of compulsory acquisition after the Christchurch earthquake. The judge took into account the purpose of the lease and its duration and the requirements of justice, which he said smoothed the doctrine's rough edges. He said, a perpetual leases will not readily be held to be frustrated and provided there remains property to which the lease can attach, right? Then particularly where such has value, the interest will subsist. Okay. Uh, what about frustration of sales of, con sales of land? Well, that's even more rare than frustration of leases because the risk of destruction or damage or change to the land use is usually borne by the purchaser as the equitable owner in the period between the making and the completion of the contract, right? So once you're the, once you're the legal owner, you take the risk of whatever happens to the land. But it, as soon as the contract is made, you become the equitable owner and you also take the risk. So um, in amalgamated investment property and John Walker, 1977, in this case, um, property, a site was advertised, note it was advertised as suitable for redevelopment. 
and Amalgamate it made it clear that it was buying the property for redevelopment. Shortly after the contract was made, the building was listed as a place of special architectural and historical interests, which meant that they couldn't do very much to it. This meant that they couldn't really develop it and it reduced the property value um, by 1.7, from, well, from 1.7 million pounds to about 200,000 pounds. So it substantially reduced the value of the property. The Court of Appeal rejected the claim of frustration because they said there was no warranty, there was no promise that the property could be developed and the risk that the property might be listed is one that all buyers of property assume. Performance was not radically different from that which was undertaken. Now that's a pretty harsh case because in a way it sort of is a bit of a retreat from uh, Crowell and Henry and impossibility of purpose because the property does seem to have been bought and sold for redevelopment. But I think it's the fact that it's um, sale and purchase of land and that is a category of contracts that courts are particularly keen to make sure is very, very certain. Okay, so we're going to then go back to the idea of construction of the contract. Remember we, let me just go back. Yeah, okay, so here we are, the three steps, right? We've looked at step number three, fundamentality. We're now going to look at construction. Let's say that the, the um, the supervening events were sufficiently fundamental. The question is, were those um, fundamental events, supervening events, nevertheless, the risk of them allocated to one or other party? All right. Now, did the contract make provision of it for it expressly or impliedly. Now, the risk may be allocated in the contract um, expressly in itself. For example, the risk of damage to property by fire passes to the buyer when the contract is entered into. The property belongs to the buyer in equity from that moment. In sale of goods contract, um, now coming under the Contracts and Commercial Act 2017 of New Zealand, the risk follows the property. Okay, now we're going to look at express allocations of risk, that is uh, expressly agreed force majeure clauses or implied allocations of risk, or it's only if you have no risk allocation that you go to the, um, that frustration can, can really um, apply. Okay, so in express provisions, now, because you will have seen that um, the cases are not always consistent and the, we haven't seen it yet, but you will see that the effect of frustra uh, frustration can be quite rigid. It means that many contracting parties are wary of leaving it to the courts and rather they themselves stipulate in the contract what should happen in certain eventualities. And these are known as for force majeure clauses, hardship clauses or intervener clauses. They put clauses, um, they put in clauses to deal with such eventualities to increase certainty, it lets the parties know where they stand, and it allows them to, to depart from the default rules provided by the law. So parties can specify the circumstances which will excuse further performance of the contract. Now, these may be wider or narrower than the scope of frustration. For example, you could talk about acts of war or um, acts of God, strikes, riots, breakdown of machinery, currency fluctuation, increased costs. You can put anything in you want. You can say, if these things happen, then what? So you can also specify the consequences of the triggering circumstances. So for example, you can provide for delay or suspension of performance. You can confer rights of cancellation on one or both parties. You can require that the parties submit to arbitration or to disciplinary procedures, or that the parties must renegotiate in good faith, or that it might trigger some sort of price escalation clause, and so on, all right? 
Um, but remember that whatever the parties have agreed has to be interpreted by the courts. This is called interpretation of contract, construction of contract, and the courts will decide whether what you've agreed covers what actually happened in a full and complete way, right? Now, the courts have taken a restrictive approach to the interpretation of such clauses in order to avoid a harsh outcome. They know that often the party who puts these clauses in will put it in for their own benefit, right? They will put in the clauses that are um, most beneficial to them, hard on the other party, and present it to you on a standard term contract on a take it or leave it basis. So the courts take a restrictive approach in order to avoid harsh outcomes. So it's analogous to the interpretation of um, exclusion of liability clauses or limitation of damages clauses. They interpret it contra, contra proferentum against the party that puts the clause forward. And of course, they do it on the basis of presumed intentions. They say, well, we presume that's what you meant. So in Metropolitan Water Board and Dick Kerr, for example, um, there was, we've encountered this case already, there was a prolonged delay when the government stopped the work and required the plant to be sold. Now there was a clause in the contract which provided for an extension of time in the event of delay whatsoever and howsoever occasioned. This was held not to cover the situation, all right? It sounds like it does, but the court said, no, 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 because the disruption and delay ensuing could not possibly have been in the contemplation of the parties to the contract when it was made. Thus, although the clause patently covered the situation, it was very narrowly interpreted to exclude um, uh, situations that could be foreseen. A delay clause suspending the contract does not apply where the delay was so abnormal, so preemptive as to fall outside what the parties could possibly have contemplated. And therefore, delay has been read as limited to normal moderate delays and as not extending to an interruption so differing in degree and magnitude from anything which could have been reasonably contemplated, such as to differ in kind. All right. Events will be excluded from the party's provision if they render further per performance of the contract unthinkable. All right. Now, another case which um, is, is uh, uh, down that track is Staffordshire Area Health Authority and South Staffordshire Works Company, a 1978 case involving our good friend Lord Denning. So a contract was made in 1929 for the supply of water for seven pence per thousand gallons at all times thereafter. Lord Denning held that the contract ceased to bind the parties 50 years later when it cost 20 times more to supply the water. Now the other judges disagreed with the reasoning, but they arrived at the same result by implying a term that the contract could be terminated by the supplier on reasonable notice. All right, and uh, let's see. Okay, so again, Jackson and Union Marine, we've encountered this uh, about the ship that had the six months delay. Now in the contract, it said that it would, it would um, take six months unless there was dangerous and accident, uh, unless there was dangerous and accident, and accident of navigation, right? The question was whether such time was so long, remember that it was delayed for six months, whether such time was so long as to put an end in a commercial sense to the commercial speculation entered upon by the ship owners and the charterers. Now the court found, yes, it was. The contract is frustrated. They said a voyage to San Francisco after the repair of the ship would have been a totally different adventure. The express exception read literally, no doubt covered the accident that had happened, but it was not intended to apply to an accident causing such extensive damage. It can only apply to events of a less seriously disruptive nature. So you can see the courts have significant amount of latitude in the way that they interpret those. So clauses that say, you know, for all time hereafter, they say, oh, um, you don't really mean that. You, you, you mean for all time sort of 
you know, uh, only for 50 years, or you can delay it for all time. They said, no, 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 only for predictable type of delays. Okay, now if there is no express risk allocation, the court might infer from the silence of the parties that they have impliedly allocated the risk of the supervening event. And if the risk has been implied, then there is no frustration, okay? Now, the question is whether, um, uh, well, okay, so um, whether the courts have impliedly allocated the risk depends on the type of transaction and the type of risk, right? So in a long-term lease or a sale of property, this, these generally allocate almost all risks to the lessor or to the buyer. A short-term lease or a for a specific purpose allocates fewer risks and therefore more likely to be frustrated. A building contract allocates to the builder the risk that the soil conditions and the cost and availability of labor and materials will make performance more onerous than anticipated. But not they do not allocate the risk that subsequent legislation that makes building illegal. Um, fluctuation of prices or value of currencies will not normally uh, frustrate the contract, okay? So how foreseeable must the supervening event be to exclude the frustration doctrine? So if you can foresee a certain event is occurring and you make the contract anyway, um, the court might think that you were uh, taking the risk to perform um, even if that risk eventuates, right? So the question is one of construction, whether despite foreseeing the risk, um, your contract should be taken to mean either that the fate of the contract should be left to the law to sort out, for example, by reference to the doctrine of frustration, or second, in the alternative, that the contract is binding irrespective of the foreseeable supervening event coming into being. That is, it would oust the frustration doctrine. Um, the court said that the inference that, it, that you uh, foreseeability ousts the frustration doctrine um, should only be drawn where the degree of foreseeability is very high. The event or its consequence must be one which any person of ordinary intelligence would regard as likely to occur, and moreover, it is an event which is foreseeable um, in some detail. Uh, the court will not allow frustration to be ousted easily by silence, right? In the Eugenia, Lord Denning said, it has frequently been said that the doctrine of frustration only applies when the new situation is unforeseen or unexpected or uncontemplated, as if that were an essential feature, but it is not so. The only thing that is essential is that the parties should have made no provision for it in their contract. Cases have occurred where the parties have foreseen the danger and yet have made no provision in the contract for it. Now, I always say to my students, that um, everything is foreseeable if you're paranoid enough. So the question is how reasonable, uh, how reasonably foreseeable was that thing? And if you foresaw it but went ahead anyway, do you mean to um, perform no matter what? Or do you mean, well, we're gonna leave it up to the courts to decide whether it's frustration or not? So let me contrast two cases. In Tatum and Gamboa, 1939, uh, Gamboa chartered a, a ship from uh, Tatum for 30 days to evacuate refugees from the Spanish Civil War. A daily rate of hire was payable until the ship was returned and it would uh, only cease if the ship went missing. So you could keep incurring freight uh, uh, hire. Halfway through the charter period, the ship, the ship, not the sheep, the ship was seized and not returned for about two months. The um, Tatum then uh, claimed the daily hire rate during the entire period. The court said no. Uh, the contract was frustrated on the ship's seizure. Although it was foreseeable that the ship might be seized um, because they said, you know, we're gonna charge you a very high rate of hire and 
uh, we are going to uh, inc you know, uh, charge you for every day it is uh, in your possession. Uh, it was not foreseeable that the ship would be detained for so long after the hire period. So, so it was hired for 30 days and it was, um, it was seized and it wasn't returned for 60 days. All right. So there was frustration in that case. Now, the New Zealand case of Hawke's Bay Electric Power Board and Thomas Borthwick and Sons uh, Limited, 1933 case. In this case, the defendant entered into a contract to buy power from, um, uh, from the plaintiff for a period of five years. Now, after three and a half years, the defendant's business premises were destroyed by the Napier earthquake. Now, you would think, well, destruction of the, well, it's not destruction of the subject matter of the contract. Remember, the subject matter is power, and they could still deliver it. The court said there was um, not frust no frustration of the contract to, for power. The defendants were liable to pay for the power. One reason was that earthquakes were not an were not an infrequent occurrence in New Zealand and should have been in the minds of the parties at the time they entered the contract as a possibility. If they made no express provision for them, the inference must be that they were content to accept the risk of them. So um, Mr. Justice Blair said, I believe it would be true to say that among businessmen in charge of large business premises, the question of loss by earthquake is at one time or another seriously considered and a decision come to as to whether the risk will or will not be taken by the business itself. I mention this point because in a place like New Zealand, where earthquakes are by no means unknown, it cannot be said that the fact that there is such a risk is not present in the minds of most businessmen. Statements in the contract itself shows that in the minds of one party at any rate, there was present the possibility of some untoward event interfering with the continuity of electric supply. So note that it was significant that um, there was a clause in the contract which was to provide for what would happen in the event of um, uh, government closure and accidents to the mains. But they didn't talk about earthquakes, right? So. Uh, they did provide for those things, but not for earthquakes. So the assumption was, well, if earthquakes happen, you pay anyway. Another clause required the company to pay a minimum of a thousand pounds a year, irrespective of the amount of power used. And uh, it, would, it would have been possible to have a work operating again within a year. Okay, um, um, I'm going to finish with Planet Kids. Um, so, in Planet Kids, uh, Glazebrook said that frustration is more likely to be excluded if an event is actually foreseen as opposed to being foreseeable. It's also important where the consequences are foreseeable. Whether the foreseeable event is one which would normally be dealt with expressly in the contract under normal commercial practice, well, you can see that with the earthquake case. The court was basically saying, look, you should have dealt with earthquake. And if you, if you didn't deal with earthquake, you have to pay. And the court said that in the end, foreseeability is something to be taken into account in the multifactorial analysis. So there ends part two. I'll come back for part three. Okay, I'm ending it.